Uh, I want to make sure. There we go. Thank you. Okay, I thought. Do I do I have the right one? If you don't, that's okay. Melrose. No, no need for any more. That's okay. That's okay. No, I'm going to. That's okay. Uh, if you have your notes that I handed out last time, you can follow along. If not, we can give it. We can give it to you later. That's okay. So I'll be, we're kind of two thirds of the way through. But I want us to continue this morning. And the reason I want us to take a little more time with this this morning is because the book of Acts is not primarily a history book. It's not. The book of Acts is a book that has living and inspiring examples for each one of us as Christians. And we are part of it. We are part of it. And so we come back again this morning to this, um, to this book, and we're talking about a tale of two churches. What are the two churches? So those of you that have been, I know it's three weeks now. What are the two churches? The first one is the church in, oh, in China, we always said if the student didn't remember, it was the teacher's fault. So the church in Jerusalem, and then a new church starts where? In, oh man, what a bad teacher you have. Begins with an A. The, thank you so much. Okay, the church in Antioch. The churches seem very different, and one is a completely Jewish church, and that's the church in Jerusalem. The church that begins in Antioch is a Gentile church. Now, there are a few Jews that are in it, but it's really a Gentile church. So um, apart from their adherence to and their belief in Jesus Christ and how he has changed their lives, these two churches are radically different. Their language is different. Uh, their cultural background is different. They're completely different. And so, but they are connected um, they are connected by one man, and that man is Barnabas. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Barnabas today. So we have Jerusalem, the mother church, and we have Antioch, the new Gentile church that germinates, and it springs up out of the lives and the evangelism of nameless Jewish followers of Jesus. And that, that should encourage us this morning. Acts is the primarily a book about, as we read, the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, with Peter, who is one of the superstars of the book of Acts, and certainly Paul, who's one of the superstars, if you will, of the book of Acts. But the Holy Spirit, who is God, and is the author of the book of Acts, included in this story, the story of Christians whose names we will not know until heaven, who are responsible for the greatest outreach into enemy territory, if you will. And that is as they begin to spread through persecution and they spread all over the place, who were they? We don't know. We know Peter and Cornelius, but what about everybody else? Because Antioch is going to become the church um, of, of the book of Acts and the New Testament church. They're going to be the big missionary church. Well, who are the, who are the ones that, that founded? Who are the ones that started? We don't know. And the Holy Spirit doesn't tell us. You and I often look at big names in the Christian world, in the church world, don't we? Wow, Billy Graham. Wow, this one, or Reinhard Bonnke, or others, all, all sorts of different ones. And we look at them and we really hold them up. And we praise God for giants, for those who have done great things uh, in God's kingdom. But God looks at what we do as well. And God uses people just like us. God uses us. And a lot of us, m most of us here in the church this morning, will probably never be known beyond Hong Kong or beyond the Philippines or beyond the UK. But that doesn't mean that God is not using us for his great work. Amen? Amen. Amen. We should be encouraged by that this morning. I want us to be encouraged also because as this church of Antioch grows, it is started by people who are fleeing persecution after the martyrdom of Stephen, right? And they, they flee persecution. And if you'll think about it, it seems like a victory of the enemy and a defeat of God's work, doesn't it? Stephen is martyred. The church flees. Um, and so as these people flee, we think what well, looks like the devil has won. And I want you to be encouraged this morning because what looks like a defeat for God and a victory for the enemy 
turns out to be the greatest evangelistic effort in the history of Christianity. And God wins. And God's plan is fulfilled. Listen carefully this morning, brothers and sisters. You and I sometimes look at immediate defeats. Have you ever felt defeated by the enemy before? You wanted to do something good for God. You tried and it seemed that you failed. Keep looking to God and remain faithful and see what God will do because God is never defeated by the enemy. Jesus defeated him on the cross once for all. He did. He did. And keep your eyes on Jesus and see what he will do. If it's not yet, if it's, if it's still not right in your life, if things aren't beautiful in your life or in your situation or in your family, it is because God isn't finished yet. God hasn't done his work, his final work yet. The Bible is so clear that he works for good. Things in your life aren't, pardon my poor grammar, things in your life aren't good, it's not good. Okay, keep on holding on to God because he works for good. And when it comes to the point, until it is good in your life, don't give up on God. He's still working, and he's working for good. Things that seem broken to us, things that seem damaged to us, things that seem a loss for us, things that seem the devil has won and I'm defeated, God's not yet finished. God's not yet finished. I, I wonder... I wonder what those Christians may have thought, some of them, as they fled Jerusalem, the persecution. And then at some point down the road, they made it to Antioch. And God did something great. God did something wonderful. God did something monumental. God did something that they had not even imagined. God did something greater than they could have expected or planned for themselves. That's our God. That's our God. And if you are going through things now and you're struggling with things, you keep on walking with God. You keep on walking with God. Look to Him. Hold on to Him. And let Him do His good work in your life, in your family, in your business, in your work, in your finances, in your body, in your mind, in every area until he brings good out, out of what the animal, enemy seems to have broken and destroyed. This is our God. And, and that's just the introduction. <laughs> but be encouraged by that this morning. You say, wow, well that was in, that, that's in there. Yeah, that's in there too. That's in there too. Be encouraged this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 And so we see that as the backdrop. And we're going to come back to these two churches, this tale of two churches that seem to be so different. Jerusalem's the big church. But when we get to the end of this chapter, do you know what happens to the big church? They're going to be in great financial need. And this baby church that has sprung up, God is going to use to bless the big mother church. God can use anybody who is given to him we sometimes think, well, how can I help this person? Well, this person is, is, is a much more mature Christian than I am. Well, they know so much more than I do. God can't use me to bless them. The blessing is not in you and in me. It is what, in God, it is what God does. It is in what God does through us for others. So we give ourselves to the Lord, and here we are. And God can use us in any situation, situations that seem bigger than, than we are and beyond our ability and beyond our capability. And, we're, and we see that this morning. So if you've not yet read uh, chapter 11, I encourage you to if you've not yet, because there's a lot more there even than we have time to go through, because it's the tale of the two churches and then this one man, Barnabas, who connects the two. Um, this great encourager. How did, how did Barnabas get his name? Because his name wasn't Barnabas. It was Joseph. That's right. It was Joseph. Um, Barnabas didn't make a name for himself. We sometimes change our names, don't we? Well, I don't like the name I was given. I don't like the name I was born with, and we and we change our names, right? And that's okay. Um, my my sister was named Rebecca, uh, and my brother was named. Philip, as you all know, and uh, here I was overseas all these times, and I go back, uh, in our, but in our family, she was always Becky, 
and my brother was always, he was always Philip, and I came back years later, and she is now Rebecca, but I call her Becky, you know. Um, and Philip is now Phil, but I call him Philip, you know. So we sometimes change our names. Um, but Barnabas didn't change his name. Barnabas gained this nickname from those around him, perhaps from the apostles, because the Bible said he was called Barnabas, the son of encouragement. So he gains his nickname by what people see in him and by what he's doing and how he's acting. Oh, and we've talked about this before. I think some, maybe a couple of years ago, I talked just about Barnabas. And at the time I asked you, I don't know if you remember this question or not, if people were to look at you and give you a nickname, what might it be? Some of us would say, ouch, <laughs> you know. Um, but wouldn't it be wonderful if each one of us, we had a good nickname, an, uh, uh, a God-honoring nickname, because people saw something in our lives that was good, that was, in, that, was, that was a blessing and an honor to the Lord in some way. And that's what we see in Barnabas, and we're going to be talking a lot more about Barnabas this morning. He earned his nickname in the early days of the church. We know that he gave generously, right? We know that he, by his life and by his deeds, we know that he promoted unity in the church. We've talked about that already. And we've already, uh, we know that he vouched for the newly converted Saul when the Jerusalem leaders doubted his conversion. He's not really saved. Is he really born again? We don't think so which sort of says something, doesn't it? Uh, they were the leaders. They should have had discernment to know that, that, um, that this Saul really was, really was truly converted. But Barnabas, the encourager, as we're going to see today, vouched for him. Oh, what a blessing it must be. And we'll talk about this a bit more later. Brothers and sisters, there are people around you, whether you feel you have the gift of encouragement or not, there are people around us that need encouragement in many, many different ways. And encouragement takes many different forms. Every one of us should be active in this area. We should be, and the Holy Spirit will work that, and the Holy Spirit will do that. I don't want to keep on going there. I'll, I will get to that a little bit more. But we've seen these things already in the life of Barnabas. And then we, as we talked about before, that when the, um, when the church in Jerusalem, when they heard about the, uh, the church in Antioch, they sent out Barnabas to travel to Antioch. And if you'll remember, last time we talked about this, who perhaps would have been a better choice? Somebody already had experience, right? Teaching, teaching, preaching to Gentiles. It was Peter, right? We spent a long time talking about that. Peter had already gone to Cornelius' house, but Peter's not chosen. There was somebody else that could have gone as well. Remember the seven they sort of became the first deacons of the church. Remember, there were seven that were more, sort of uh, a Greek background, although they were Jewish. There was one who was named Nicholas. Guess where he was from? Do you remember? If you go back and look at Acts chapter 6, he was from Antioch, Nicholas of Antioch. But they didn't send Nicholas either. Instead, they chose this man Barnabas. Why? Well, we're going to see that today as we look further. So let's go on. Uh, you remember we talked about this, some of the practical considerations, and you remember this, so I don't want to take too much time to focus on it. When there is a work of God, God will use, God will use natural things that, um, that, uh, that we have. There are natural abilities. God will use more than natural abilities, but he uses natural abilities too. For example, let's see, I don't want to offend anyone. Are there some, but let me put it this way. Are there some of you that uh, you would never in a million years stand behind a microphone and sing because you know your voice? Any of you? Thank you. You know, that's right, Steve, Steve and Susan. But Steve raised his hand very, very quickly. I still remember his great love for his wife on his wedding day. Do you remember this? He's laughing now. He sang a love song. <laughs> you, do, do you all remember that? I remember that. <laughs> that's right. You, you, somebody... Somebody tell his wife that, <laughs> okay? He sang, which was a mark of his great love, because Steve, how shall I put it? It's not one of his natural abilities, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so God uses, in, in his church, there are natural gifts. 
and we recognize that. We would never say, hey, Steve, we would, like, would you be one of the backup singers, please? We wouldn't do that, <laughs> okay? Because he doesn't have a natural gift in that area. So there are natural abilities that God uses, and Barnabas certainly had them. He was Greek-speaking. We talked about that. He was from the island of Cyprus, right? Uh, so he was a native of Cyprus. What else? He had a Greek cultural background, and he had to be Greek-speaking because the church in Antioch was a, was a Greek church, okay? So that's the language they, they spoke. What else? He was an early Jewish convert to Christianity, so he had a good foundation, okay? And, the, and his insight was respected as well. They trusted him when he said, hey, Saul has really become a Christian. You can trust him. And they accepted that. So his insight was proven and respected. So these are just natural, these are some of the natural things that Barnabas had going for him, uh, and that's why they sent him. But we talked about this last time, and I want to remind you, we are part of the church of the living God. And because we're part of the church of the living God, our natural abilities, our natural talents, our experience, our culture, our education, all of these things are not enough. They're not enough. Can God use them? Yes. Does God use them? Yes. But they're not enough because God is a supernatural God and he goes beyond what we are naturally. Does that, does that make sense? It should. It should. And so there was more going on in Barnabas that qualified him to be the one who would go. We talked about this already. He was generous and sacrificial. We, he worked towards a spirit of unity. Oh, my goodness. If there's anything that's needed in the church of God is someone who has a heart and, uh, for unity in the church and one who, who works towards unity in the church in many, many different ways. And Barnabas had that. Uh, and then it says, uh, I picked up just from verse 24. I hope you have your Bibles with you if you do, because... This says, for he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. So here are some of the spiritual qualifications in addition to this. And that's in Acts 11.24. If you've got your Bibles, you could go back and you could look a little bit more. Let me just read it to you from Acts 11.24. Um, it says, uh, when, this is in verse 23. When he arrived and he saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. And then it says, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit uh, and faith, for he was a good man. So it's connected with what was there before. And this is where we stopped last time. So let's look at what comes next. It says that he was a good man. Remember, we, we stopped right here, and this is in your notes. And good man means of excellent character, okay? Of excellent character. That's the, that's the, the biblical meaning and the biblical understanding and this understanding in the language of that word. So he was a good man. A lot of times they'll say, oh, he's a good person. He's a good person. And that can mean any number of things. But in the Bible, what it means when it's used in the Bible is he has an excellent character. It's an excellent Christian character as well. There's a, there's a God likeness in him. So he has excellent character. So I want us to, to look at that just a little bit more um, as we, he has a good character, and I want us to talk about character just a minute. How many of you have ever prayed to God for a good character? Oh, God. Oh, God, give me a good character. Brothers and sisters, that is one prayer God will never answer, at least not directly. Did you know that? Character, good character is not a gift from God. It's never a gift from God. Character, good character, is something that is worked out in our lives. It's never a gift. It's never a gift. And so character, good character is not a gift from God. Character is what, our character is what develops in our lives as we live each day as we go through situations and circumstances, both good and bad, and we choose. And as we choose, rightly or wrongly, or somewhere in the middle, our character is developed. We sometimes think our choices don't matter very much. Have you ever thought that? I used to think that. Well, no, but it's not hurting anybody. Nobody really knows. I'm just, you know, I'm going to choose this or I'm going to choose that. It's not something that's going to affect 
anybody else, but it affects us because our character is developed in that way. Does that make, am I offending anyone this morning? Am I surprising anyone this morning? I hope not, but that's how character is developed. And the way that we choose in rightly or wrongly develops our character. It develops our character. It's never a gift. You and I go through hard times and bad times, don't we? We're treated unfairly. We are maligned. We're accused. We're persecuted. Things happen to us. We go through maybe a health, a health problem that is so, so hard. Something happens to our loved ones. All of these things happen. What are we going to do? I don't know about you, but I, if I could, I would wish away all the bad things in my life. Would you? I don't want any, don't, don't give me any financial squeezes. Do you, how many of you love a financial squeeze? Oh, Lord, squeeze my pocketbook. <laughs> we never, we don't want a financial squeeze, do we? But God takes us through it. I want perfect health, but I don't have perfect health. God, and God takes us through it. And we go through a time of hardship from other people in relationships. Oh, God, get me out of this. And God doesn't. But he's taking us through, if we will let him, that we might choose rightly and choose well. And he will give us his grace. And godly character, good character, will develop in our lives. Are you working with a tough person right now? Are you living with a tough person right now? Congratulations. <laughs> you have a chance for good character to, to develop. You also have a chance for bad character to develop. Right? It's true. We, we know this, but we don't usually think of it in this way. And as I was praying and preparing, I really, the Lord showed me really how practical this section is. You know, I was thinking, oh, Barnabas, this and that or whatever. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart about just the, the really practical, the really practical things. Barnabas had, he was a good man, which meant he had an excellent character. That meant that in his life, Barnabas had made good choices as he went through things in the same way that you and I also have that as well. You and I will develop in our character towards excellence and godliness or towards other things or somewhere in the middle, depending on what we choose, depending on what we do. And God will always work with you if you'll let him. But character is our choice. It really is. It really is. And God will work with us. Think with me for just a minute. Barnabas did not choose to be from Cyprus. He didn't choose to be Greek speaking. He didn't choose to be a man. Let me ask you, although I know the world we live in now, that's a whole different thing, right? There are some things about you that you have not chosen. Are you Filipino? Some of you are. Did you choose that? Not that I know of. <laughs> or from the UK, or American, North American, you're male or you're female, you're this or you're that. You had no choices about some of those things, did you? So the things that you didn't have a choice about, let it go. Give it up. Say, God, here, this, this is you. Let it. But the things that you and I do have choices about, give it to God and let God work with you to make you a person of excellent character. A good person. So Barnabas didn't choose those things, but his character, he had something to say about. His character was what was developed in his life. And because he had a good character, he was qualified to go to the church in Antioch. The Spirit empowers him. It's not his own strength. It's not his own wisdom or ability. And the same must be true of us if we want to be used by God. Do you want to be used by God? Do you want to say, God, here I am. Use me. Use me. That's great, but we've got further steps to go, right? There are things that we do that qualify us, that get us ready so that God can use us. What else do we see here? What are some other things? He was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? So this qualifies him. Here are the spiritual qualifications. This means that at one time, probably on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, Barnabas was 
filled with the Holy Spirit and he spoke in other tongues and then he was full of the Holy Spirit. Is that what that means? That is not what that means. Full of the Holy Spirit in the Bible does not mean a one-time experience with the Holy Spirit way back when. And we can say, see, way back when, 10 years ago, one time, I whatever. That's not what it means. Full of the Holy Spirit means the Holy Spirit's in charge of our lives, doesn't it? It means the Holy Spirit controls us. It means we submit to Him. It means that as we go about our days, we start to do something. The Holy Spirit says, don't do that. We start to say something and the Holy Spirit says, zip it. Or don't say that. And it's usually a soft thing. And it means we're being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Barnabas was full of the Holy Spirit. Some of you this morning say, I want to be full of the Holy Spirit. How do I qualify? How, how can that be said of me? How can that be true of me? Well, God is the one who does it. But you can bring yourself and put yourself in the place where God will answer your hungry heart. You read his word, you pray, you come to him and say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, be in charge of my life. Control my life. I want to be obedient to your leading and to your prompting. It is God who fills us with Holy Spirit, but he responds to our hearts and our desires. Amen? Amen. Amen. How else does, does Barnabas qualify spiritually? What does it say? He was full of faith. I really like this one. He is full of faith. For any work of the Lord, we've got to be full of faith. We've got to be full of faith. And I want to talk about this just a little bit. Because did you know that we can have the gift of faith? Have, you ever, have any of you ever, ever been given the gift of faith? I don't mean faith for salvation, but a special gift of faith. And it's miraculous, isn't it? Susan is nodding her head. She, know, she knows. And some of us know that as well. And it will be a special empowering at a special moment, at a special time. And it's something beyond ourselves. It comes from God. It comes, it comes from God. And it fills our hearts and we just... It, 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 it comes from God. But there is another part that is full of faith, and that comes, again, by our Christian lives. That we are people who, are, who really believe, God, you are able. God, it is possible. Faith always, listen, faith always lifts us beyond ourselves into the realm of what God can do. It lifts us beyond our puny possibilities into... It lifts us, you're awake now, aren't you, if you weren't before. It lifts us beyond, you can tell I'm excited about this. It lifts us beyond our puny possibilities into what is possible with God. When we are people of faith, we go beyond, the, we look beyond the too low, the, the I have jet lag. <laughs> the five loaves and the two fish. There we go. It was, I was saying the other, rain, or other way around. We, we look beyond the five loaves and the two fish we have into God and to what He can do. If we are not people of faith, brothers and sisters, if we never look beyond, then we will always say, I can only do this. I only have five loaves and two fish, so I can't do that because what I have can only do this. But when God fills our heart with faith, when we become people of faith, we begin to step out and see there is more that can be done. There is more that can, that can happen. I can be more. I can do more. God will do more through me. And that's what we see in Barnabas. He was a person, he was full of faith. I love to be around people who are full of faith people. I really, really do. And there, if I were, I, there are a few people I could mention. Have they raised the dead? No. They've never raised the dead. I won't even go down that track. I won't even go down that track. They've never raised the dead. They've never this. But they're just people who believe God and, and act on what God's word says. And they step forward. Oh, brothers and sisters, if you and I, if you and I want to see God work, and we want to see God do things, and we want God to change our families and change our lives and change our situations, we've got to be people of faith. We've got to be people of faith. Well, how do we get there? Just I want to be a person of faith. Have you ever prayed that? I have before. I want to be a person of faith, especially when I've been around people who are faith-filled people. But what I have learned is, unless God gives me the gift of faith, that special, empowering, miraculous gift of faith, there are things that I can do to become a person who is more full of faith. And if I can do them, 
you can do them as well. What does the Bible say? Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Do you want to become a person of faith? Start reading the Word of God on a regular basis. Not just Sunday morning when somebody else reads it to you. Not just two or three verses in the morning because that's, that's your daily devotional. Please don't get upset. You know what I mean. We're going to have to fill our lives. Do you know why? We're going to have to really take more of the Word into our lives. Because everything that is not of faith is going to be bombarding us day after day after day. All you have to do is go to your workplace, right? All you have to do is go around people that are out there and you're going to hear everything that is against faith and is against God that will tear you down, that will, that will fill you with, that will make you see limitations only. We're going to have to get in God's Word. We're going to have to spend more time. We're going to have to spend more time with the God of faith through prayer. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to be dogmatic this morning. I'm not trying to be legalistic, so you must pray more, you must read the Word more. I, I'm not saying that because we are making choices. We are making choices. But I will tell you, for me, um, it's up to you. Do what you, do what you want to do. Do what you will to do. But you know, I've told you before, I used to, when I was going back and forth between work and here, um, I would often listen to Chris, Christian music. And I, love, and I love listening to music. But some years ago, I started changing somewhat. Uh, and I started listening more and more to the Word of God. I really did. I would just, just listen to the Word of God. And I told you when I started preparing for the book of Acts, uh, in the last, it's been maybe eight or nine months or maybe almost a year now since I've been teaching in Acts, I've probably listened to Acts maybe 50 times. And every time I listen, I haven't gotten tired of it. I hear something new and my faith begins to grow. And I think, well, we could do that at Lighthouse. We can be that at Lighthouse. God, I can be that. And we, when we take the Word of God into our hearts and our lives, it will transform us and change us. And we won't even, rec we won't even realize it until one day we realize, I'm changed. I'm different. And that's one of the ways we become people of faith. Amen? And so Barnabas was full of faith. And that's great. And that's needed. You know why it was needed in that situation? Barnabas was going to a brand new church that did not have a strong Christian foundation. And there weren't a lot of mature Christians around him. And he goes into this new church that is Greek speaking and that doesn't have a lot of teaching about God or a foundation about God. And he goes into it and they're all baby Christians and they're all new Christians, which is great. Praise the Lord because there's a lot of zeal and there's a lot of excitement. But guess what? What do babies do? We all know what babies do. They whine, they cry, they make a mess in their diapers. All of these things that babies do. That's the physical example. Well, guess what? Baby Christians go through some of the same things as well, right? Oh, and there'll be all sorts of emotion, then great discouragement. And, and they'll be all excited, and then, huh, and I want to give up. It's too hard. I can't do it. I can't do it. And there are all these things and it was a new church, it was zealous, but it was a baby church. But here comes Barnabas, a man full of faith. And it's going to take a man full of faith because a man full of faith sees what God can do in that situation. That's what faith does. That's what faith does. And that's what God wants for us as well. And so Barnabas goes, praise the Lord. He's full of the Holy Spirit and he's full of faith. But there's one more thing, and this is where we get to this morning. Barnabas has a God-given gift. He has a God-given gift. What is his God-given gift? Counseling. Counseling? That's, that was a demonstration of it, okay? Okay, and it is seen, so there was counseling there, it's seen in encouragement, okay? So it's seen in encouragement. He had a God-given gift. That's the number one reason he was sent to Antioch because he was an encourager. He was called the son of encouragement all the way back in Acts chapter 4. What does this tell us? They saw something in his life. Not just, have you ever been around a person that's just po a positive person? They're always positive? Yeah? This is not what that means, <laughs> by the way. Sometimes we have personality things, and God can use our personalities, but this is a God-given gift, 
It is a spiritual strength. It comes from God and it is given to Barnabas and it is given to help the church. And we're going to finish up in the, in the last 20 or so minutes that we have this morning talking about this because you and I also have gifts in the church. It may not be the same gift as Barnabas, but you and I have gifts also. And so we're going to look at that. So it's a God-given gift. What do we see? Let's look at it. We're going back now. They send Barnabas. He arrives. He sees the evidence of the grace of God. He was glad and what? Encourage them. Barnabas was the son of encouragement. So here we see Barnabas putting into practice the gift he's been given. So I already know this morning, because some of you I know very well, some of you I know your gift is the gift of encouragement. I know that because I know you. You may have some other gifts as well, but I know you have the gift of encouragement. And believe me, the church really needs the gift of encouragement. Those of you that say, I don't think that's my gift. Don't worry. The same principles still apply. So this is for each one of us this morning. Although you're going to see a lot about encouragement. You see, he goes and he was glad. Why? He sees a brand new church and the work of God. And so he was happy about it. An encourager will always be joyful about the good that he sees. Now there are other gifts and they'll come in and they'll say, hmm, that brand new church there's a lot of flesh here. Too much excitement. They don't know the word of God enough. Settle down, folks. That's not what they needed so much at that moment. Instead, here came an encourager, and he saw the good things that were happening. He tells them what to do, and we see a little example of it here. They were excited, brand new Christians, and what does he say? He encourages them to do what? Remain true to the Lord with all your hearts, with a firm resolve. Ah, that's not zeal and excitement. That's choosing. Keep walking with the Lord, right? So he encourages them in this. And then it goes into this part that we've already read. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And what happens next? And a great number of people were brought to the Lord because Barnabas used the gift that God had given him in this circumstance. Good things happened. God's work was done. Listen, when you and I use the gifts that God has given us, good things will happen. They will. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it works. And we see the example. We see the evidence in Barnabas. He has a God-given gift, ability, or strength of encouragement. And they've acknowledged it. Remember, I've already talked about it, but just a reminder, Saul came to Jerusalem. The leaders didn't believe he was really born again. What does Saul do? Uh, sorry, what does Barnabas do? He goes, he gets Saul, he listens to him so he knows his testimony, and then he takes him and he says, this man really is born again. He encourages Saul and the church is built. That's what an encourager does. And we see this with, Barn with Barnabas. What does encouragement mean? It's here. It's the same word that is used, the same root word that describes the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the helper, the one who comes alongside. Have you ever physically gotten tired before and somebody came along beside you and helped you? Maybe as you were walking, maybe you were hiking somewhere. And uh, I know that there are people who hike in this church and they're all back there in that corner, right? <laughs> The, the Ka family and others hike as well. And maybe, maybe one of them got tired and somebody came along beside and helped when they began to grow weak. That's what encouragement means, and we see this. So it's no wonder that Barnabas, with the spiritual gift of encouragement, is sent to Antioch. And so we go a little bit further as we look at this, and I want you to think about Lighthouse this morning as we think about the work of God. So a great number of people were brought to the Lord but this is not the end of the story. So he has the God-given gift of encouragement. That's why he was sent. But let's see what happens next. He is there. He teaches them. And then look what happens next. So Barnabas, a bunch of people get saved. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. How far was Tarsus from Antioch? 100 miles. I'm sorry. Kilometers, I'm not sure. 140? 60, go up. You know, the metrics just never worked in the U.S. I'm so sorry. So 160 or so. So it was a long way, and he didn't go by car, and he didn't go by bullet train. He probably walked. 
160 some, some kilometers to get Saul and to bring him back. When you have the gift of encouragement and you use it, do you know what will happen? You will see gifts that other people have as well. So he went to look for Saul. Why did he go look for Saul? Bingo! Because he knew Saul's testimony. What was Saul's testimony? Saul was called to teach and preach to the, to the Gentiles. This is a Gentile church. And so Barnabas goes, he gets Saul, he finds him, he brings him back. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Oh my goodness, there are three sermons in this. And we don't have time for it because we only have about 12 more minutes. But I want you to see something here this morning. Brothers and sisters, we're often part of a church or we get, and, and sometimes we get in a church with other Christians and there is sometimes jockeying for position. There's jockeying or pushing for power or for authority or for notice me or let me do this or let me do that. It's not of God when it's like that. But when you and I use the gift that God has given us, for the church in the right attitude and in the right way there is room for every gift to function in the church there's room for every gift to function at lighthouse please don't say oh well i can't do that because she does that there's room for every gift here's the example look up here Here's Barnabas. He has teaching gifts. He's encouraging. But what does he do? He looks and he sees there's more that could be done. There's greater need. And I know just the person. And he finds Saul, brings him back, and look what happens. So for a year, wow, two leaders, Barnabas and Saul, working equally together. Is there a fight? No fight. Is there a jealousy? No jealousy. Are good things happening? Good things are happening. There's such growth in Christian character that people who are not believers in Jesus look at them and what do they say? You are Christians. You are like Christ. You are different from us. You're like Christ. And that first happens. And that's the result in large part because here are two godly men using the gifts that God have given them not in competition but in cooperation there's no place for competition in the church of God there's no place for competition in lighthouse and if we find that beginning to kind of grow in ourselves at times and that just go back to God and say God I don't like that it's in me it's ugly I don't want it take care of it I choose and your Christian character grows and then you keep going because God cares about, we'll look at this in just a minute, God cares. He gives you a spiritual gift, but your Christian character will influence your gift in the church. And we'll talk about that just a little bit more in just a minute as we come to a close. But let me go ahead and say it right now as we're beginning to wind up. God cares about our character. If you're a Christian this morning, you have at least one gift from God that is for the church. You have it. You say, I don't feel like it. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you feel like it or not. You have it. Well, I, I don't know what it is. You still have it. And we'll talk more about this at, at, at another time. But God cares about your character, your Christian character. And if you have problems, if, let me change my pronouns. When we have problems in our character, and in our development, that will limit and influence the using and the working of our gifts in God's church, because God cares about our character. He wants us to be people of good character. Perfect character? Nope. It's a perfect gift because it comes from God and He gives perfect things. But He puts that perfect gift in imperfect people. Me. You. And that's why we've got to have grace for one another. We have to. If you expect perfection from the brothers and sisters around you, or even from your pastors, you will always be disappointed, guarantee you, because we're imperfect. But I am 
walking in the right way. I'm going, I've got my nose pointed, I hope, I trust, in the right direction. And you need to have your nose pointed in the right direction. So God works on our character. And we have this gift and we use it. And we see it with Barnabas and Saul, don't we? It's not in competition, it's cooperation. Remember I told you at the beginning that Barnabas was really generous? Remember I told you he had a generous? Do you know what, what else we see here? Have you ever looked at somebody else before and maybe they, they, do, they do things better than you do and, and you feel a little bit jealous? You kind of, <laughs> we start to feel badly about it. Listen, we already know, know who was the... Who is going to be the more prominent of these two men? Who? Barnabas or, or Saul? Paul. Of course Saul, Paul, is going to be. Of course it's going to be him. You don't think Barnabas knew that? I think Barnabas knew that. Here's a man specifically called to preach to the Gentiles. Here's a man who has more education than I do. Here's a man who has more teaching gifts than I do. But Barnabas, because he had a generous heart, was willing to share the stage and was willing to bring Saul, to go get this young man and bring him back where he could exercise his gifts. And the church was healthier for it. The church was better for it. And if we can operate in Lighthouse or whatever church you are part of, because some of you are visiting here this morning and you're parts of other churches, and I don't know about your churches, but these principles are the same whatever church you're part of. They really are brothers and sisters, whatever church you're part of. And may I say to you, if you are in a church, if you're not part of Lighthouse, where you feel like, I can't use my gift, first of all, pray and say, Lord, is there something about my character that's closing doors? And if, and if it's not, or if you're part of a church or a group where you feel like there's no space, there's no place for me to use the gift that you've given me, God, then you know what? Ask God and say, God, is this the church home for me? Because God wants you to use the gift that he has given you for his church. Amen? Amen. He wants us to. He wants us to. And so he goes to get, he goes to get Saul, and they teach for a year. The church is healthy. And now let's apply. I've already been doing it, but let's apply it to ourselves as we come to a close this morning. There are natural qualities and characteristics. Barnabas had them, and God used them. It's time, brothers and sisters, to stop looking at what you are not and what others are and wishing, I wish I were like that. The things that you can't do, the things that you can't change in any way, in any way. If you can't do something about it, give it to God and let him use you as you are. He made you what you are. So their natural qualities and characteristics, accept them, put them in God's hands. Character, it's our part. It's our part. When I was in school a long, long time ago, my teacher on the report card, I don't know if they do that anymore, there was always a place for the teacher to write notes. And you know what the, he would, the teacher might say, oh, excellent, or something like that. And sometimes the teacher would write, needs improvement <laughs> and sometimes the teacher would write shows improvement <laughs> okay well we want to be showing improvement don't we we want to be showing improvement and so character is our part if you're going through a tough time right now if you're going through things that have been difficult look at it in another way and start making better choices right start making better choices because god's going to use your character then be full of the holy spirit it's an ongoing christian walk We've talked about that. Full of faith, how does that happen? We cultivate that through time spent with the God of faith. You want to be around a person who's really full of faith? Get around God. Get around God. Really, get around God. And cultivate time with Him. God's gift, be a good steward. Use it to serve one another. That God's gift, and I think, I think we're going to finish up. Yeah, we'll have time to finish up with... Ha, have time. Okay. God's gift, be a good steward. Use it to serve one another. You have a gift. What is my gift? Please don't go online and say, I'm going to take my spiritual gift test now. Um, I think there are good things about that, but I think there's some shortcomings as well. And let me give you some verses. If you want to say, yeah, but what about my spiritual gift? Instead of 
going online and taking a test, look at these things instead, okay? Go to the Word of God. Go to 1 Corinthians 12, 7, and you will see a spiritual gift is given to whom? To the spiritually mature ones. No. It's given to each of us so that we can do what? We can help each other. That's, what it, that's, that's a, uh, um, a simple translation. A spiritual gift so we can help each other, or it says, for the common good. For the common good. That's why you've got to be careful about tests. When we take tests for spiritual gifts, you know what we tend to do? Take the test. I have the gift of administration. I, I, I. And it's not about I, I, I. It's for others, right? It's for the common good. Okay? 1 Corinthians 12, 7. 1 Peter 4, 10. I love this one. You know I love the book of 1. You, you know I love 1 Peter so very much. Um, as each has received a gift. Ah! There it goes again. It's given to each of us. If you're a Christian this morning, you have at least one spiritual gift. At least one. Some of you are a little bit younger. You may be teenagers or early 20s. You say, well, I have to be older before I have a spiritual gift. No, you have at least one now if you're a Christian. If you're not yet a Christian, you don't yet have a spiritual gift <laughs> because it is for the common good. It's for the good in his church. And so use it to serve one another. How many of us, we want a spiritual gift so we can say, look, look at my spiritual gift. I'm a leader. I have the gift of leadership. <laughs> uh, you, you're laughing because you know it's true. You know it's true. What does God's word say? Use it to serve one another. Every spiritual gift God gives is for service. Even if it's leadership, it's for service. Even, it's, even if it's exhortation, it's for service. It's, it's serving. It's serving. It's always serving. It's always serving. God's stu good stewards of God's grace. And this one's really important because when it comes to good stewards, what does that mean? Oh, here, here's my gift. I have a gift. It's mine. It's shiny. It's pretty. It's this. It's that. No. It, we are good stewards. What does that mean? There you go. It's not ours. It's not ours to say, look at what I have. It's ours to use for God's purposes, right? It's ours to use for God's purposes. And so there is a challenge this morning to you. There's a challenge to each one of us this morning. Some of us are sitting in this church this morning and we have seldom, if ever, used our spiritual gifts. You're a steward of it. So you'll answer, we answer to God. We have to use it. There's so much more here. We'll come back to it, but I'm just giving you the verses now. Romans 12, 6 through 8. In His grace... God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well, okay? These are the spiritual gifts. By the way, this is what I think right down here and what many, many Bible teachers and pastors and teachers say. In this passage right here, you will find yourself somewhere. There are other spiritual gifts, but these gifts, Romans 12, 6 through 8, got it? These are most of the time, these are called the motivational gifts, okay? This, you'll have, you will have at least one of these gifts. And this is not, I, I, it's time, it's almost time to, it's time to stop. So we can't go into details, but let me put it this way. You will find yourself somewhere here. Go read some other Bible translations. And let me put it this way. I, I should have brought a pair of sunglasses this morning. I didn't because it was pouring rain when I left my house this morning. But have you ever put on a pair of sunglasses? You still see what everybody else sees, but there's a different color, right? You still see the buildings, but there's a color. Have you ever seen somebody wear uh, maybe pink, sungla pink glasses, you know, they're tinted or whatever? They still see what everybody else sees, but it's kind of a pink tint, right? So, I think of it in this way, right here. You have one of these gifts, and it's a little bit like You've got glasses. You're going to see what everybody else sees, but it's going to be particular to you in some way. Everything you see, it's going to be through this in some way. I, I already know what my primary gift is, and it should be very clear to all of you as well. My primary gift is teaching. That's very, very clear. And so that's why sometimes I bore you when I give you too many details. I'm sorry. I apologize. 
that's one of the parts of the gift of teaching that needs to be reined in, and I'm working on it. But that's how I see it, and so there's a problem. And so you know what I'll do? I'll Google it, and I'll look up. Now there's this, 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 and this, and then I'll talk about it, whatever. Some of you have a different gift. Maybe your gift is mercy. And so you look at something, you think, oh, this is really, this is really hard. We need to take care of it in this way. Some of you have a gift of service, and you say, well, here's this problem here. Well, let me do this, and if I do this, I can help them. Or some of you will look at it and you say, oh, well, look, well, here's the need. Oh, here's the need. I can help with finances, because why? You have the gift of giving, okay? There you are right there. Some of you will look at it, and you say, you've got a leadership gift, and you know what you'll do? You say, oh, okay, well, there's this going on. There needs to, it needs to be organized in this way. I need to put it together in this way, because obviously the problem is it hasn't been organized properly. Now, some of you right now are saying, that's right. Those of you right now that are saying, things should be better organized at Lighthouse, you probably have leadership gifts. Probably. Or you see things. Why? Because that's the way you look at the church because that's the gift God has given you. Does that make sense? But I can't stop there this morning because we want to close. So here this is, and you have it, and it says, do it. Do it. If, you, let me just, sorry, can I back up? Oh, I went past it. Yeah. If God has given you the gift, the ability to prophesy, do it. If your gift is serving, do it. If you are a teacher, do it. If your gift is encouraging, be encouraging. If you've got a gift, use it. Use it. This is the picture of Barnabas and brothers and sisters. This is the example for us this morning. And some of you this morning are saying, well, I'm challenged, but Pastor Jennifer, I don't know what my gift is. What's my gift? May I say to you, please don't run to the internet and say, I'm going to take the spiritual gift test now. Instead, meditate on the Word of God and ask God. Say, God, would you speak to me? God, God, would you show me what you have for me to do? I will tell you this. If you find great joy in doing it in the church, it is likely your gift. If you are fulfilled when you do it, it is likely your gift. Because God has put a gift in you for his church to make his church healthy and to fulfill your life. It's not a burden. It's not a duty. It will bring you joy and fulfillment. And if you've been sitting in Lighthouse or whatever church you're part of and you've just been a consumer, it's time to be a producer. And God has given us gifts. Amen. Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you for Barnabas, whom we shall meet one day in heaven. We know we will. We know we will. What a great encourager. But Lord, we don't want a, a history lesson this morning. Lord, we want to be like Barnabas was, using the gift that you had given him to do good things. Lord, we want to use the gift or gifts that you have given us for good things, for the health of the church, to serve in good, with a good character, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.